This episode was made possible by ExpressVPN. Start browsing the web securely with three months free by going to expressvpn.com slash MMI. On this episode of Meet My Inspiration, I'm talking with John Brenkis. John is probably best known for the long-running and award-winning series on ESPN called Sport Science. John has created and hosted many television series, written a New York Times best-selling book, hosts multiple podcasts, and works as chief marketing officer for sports drink brand Killcliff. And now, please welcome John Brankus. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Minion, and this is Meet My Inspiration. My guest today is John Brankus. John, thank you for joining me on Meet My Inspiration today. No so John, problem. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. Thank you. So, John, you've done a lot in your life and career. Would you mind by giving us a quick overview of your background and what you're working on now? Yeah, I um, am best known as the host and creator of a property called Sports Science that was on ESPN and Fox for a very long time. We did 1,800 episodes, won six Emmys, have written a New York Times bestselling book on human performance. Um, I owned a television production company for a very long time uh, that I ended up selling. Um, so I've made thousands of hours of TV and a bunch of movies and documentaries, and I've spent my whole life in entertainment. Now I'm, uh, my primary job is to work for, as the chief marketing officer, the CMO for Killcliff, the clean energy drink, which is, um, you can check it out at kill, K-I-L-L, cliff, C-L-I-F-F dot com. Um, and, you know, I'm really, really going around promoting things, you know, using the platform that I've fortunately been given through sports science to let people know that. You know, there are some amazing products out there, Kill Cliff being one of them. Um, you know, I, I've been incredibly fortunate to do endorsement deals with some of the largest companies in the world, including Intel and Ford and Adidas and Nike, you know, a whole bunch of giant Fortune 500 companies. Um, and there are a lot of companies out there that are, you know, rising superstars. So, you know, just using my platform and my knowledge and skill, you know, skill set to uh, develop messages that, you know, preach the truth. Um, you know, there are clean energy drinks and there are some amazing products out there that uh, are good for people. Awesome. And we're going to get into a lot of that in more detail in a few minutes, but let's go back in time a little bit um, to your childhood. So where did you grow up, John, and what kind of upbringing did you have? Yeah, I grew up in Vienna, Virginia. I was born in Washington, D.C. proper. I, uh, you know, lived in Vienna at that time, which is eight miles outside of the city. You know, Tyson's Corner wasn't really even built yet. Um, you know, so it wasn't the metropolis that it is today. And it was, uh, you know, by all accounts, an, an awesome suburban neighborhood. Um, I, for whatever reason, on my street, which was Westview Court in uh, Vienna, Virginia, I had one of every type of person. So, you know, we had the Garzas and the Holmeses and the Smiths and the Woos and the Youngs and the Hoyters and the Brinkuses. And, you know, it, it was really a sort of a Benetton uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of street. So, you know, I grew up with uh, a lot of influences, you know, very multicultural for, you know, an area that wasn't particularly um, diverse. My street was really diverse. Wow. You're lucky to have had that. Well, as you said a second ago, you're probably best known for the long-running TV series, Sports Science. Um, and you've stated before that sports and science are two of your greatest passions. So I'm curious, which captured your attention first in your youth? Was it sports or science? It, it probably is sport just because, you know, I was, you know, I was a decent little athlete in Vienna, Virginia. I mean, you know, I played football, basketball, baseball, ran some, ran some track. I was never a great athlete, but I was decent enough. Um, and I was always playing something year round. And when you grew up in the DC area, you literally, as a kid, I mean, the Redskins were everything. I mean, Sunday afternoon, I mean, literally everything stopped. No one was in the store. No one did anything. You watched the Redskins. Um, you know, the, or, the, the Washington Nationals did not exist in my childhood, so you had the Cal Ripken Orioles. Um, you know, and the, the Orioles won a World Series, and uh, the Redskins won three Super Bowls, and the Bullets, the basketball team, uh, you know, won a national, uh, an NBA championship. 
and the Capitals were just perennial, um, you know, were, were uh, perennially in the playoffs. And you just grew around, grew up around sports. I was always playing sports, watching sports, loving sports. And my love for science is really mixed with my love of math. Mm. Um, I, was, I was always just a strong uh, student. I, I, I'm the kind of student where I, I pay attention. I sit in class, I pay attention. I was really blessed to have um, some incredible science and math teachers uh, in, in uh, at James Madison High School, especially. You know, a math teacher named Mr. D'Elia, um, who I had three of the four years in high school, and he just had a very, he had an incredible way of touching my mind and looking at math in a particular way. My science teachers um, really fostered my curiosity on how to look at the world and how physics, are, you know, are applied. So I was always, I was always a strong student in that, but because I loved it and because I had great teachers, so that combination of sport and science uh, was fostered at a very young age and I was tiny uh, and this plays a big role in in sort of the development of what I found interesting and how sports science came to be I mean entering high school I was four foot eight 86 pounds I was tiny I mean the by far the smallest kid in the school mm. and you know I have this massive growth spurt where I grow to five five you know <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's uh it's fine and I'm only five eight and a half and but when I was younger, I was really, I was, I, I was fast. Like I was, you know, in elementary school, even though I was a little flea, I was the fastest kid in school, but I didn't really get any faster relative to my peers um, for the rest of my life. So I was really fascinated, uh, uh, you know, just with, as people were growing and they were, you know, they became their, you know, their own, uh, you know, young adults. My God, you know, I, I don't know if I could ever do what these people you know, my friends and peers are able to do, you know, how, what is the difference between good and great? Why are there people my size who are incredible athletes and I'm just kind of an average athlete? Um, so it, it was, it was, it was baked in pretty early for me. Sure. Uh, well, John, when you were a kid, who did you look up to most? Uh, you mentioned a couple of teachers, but who did you look up to most as a kid and why? You know, <clears throat> My upbringing was awesome. Had, you know, incredible parents. You know, my dad passed away a couple of years ago and I miss him dearly, but he, you know, really taught me. Um, he had an expression, the seven P's of life, prior proper planning prevents piss poor performance. And he was very, he, he was always preaching the idea of, well, be prepared. Like whatever it is that you're going to do, make sure when you go into it, you're ready for it. Um, and my mom was, and my mom continues to be, you know, my, certainly my biggest cheerleader, um, you know, and, and they, they came, my, my mom and dad came from a, you know, small coal mining town in Pennsylvania and they escaped to the big city in Washington, D.C. And, but, you know, my mom was always so believed in me so much and continues to believe in me, just like you can do whatever you want to do, you can do it. And there were no limits. And we did not, it wasn't like we grew up wealthy. I mean, we were, a, you know, I would say typical middle-class family um, <clears throat> in Vienna. So it wasn't like we had a ton of money to spend, but I was never yearning for money. And I didn't, didn't you know, economics didn't really resonate with me as to whether, where we sat mm -hmm. um, in the socioeconomic spectrum, because you could just do whatever you wanted to do. And that was good enough. <clears throat> so you know, my mom and my dad obviously were incredibly influential, but even outside of that, um, you know, I, like I said, I had some wonderful teachers that, that really shaped my view. My English teacher, Mr. Carbo, um, always taught me that when you hear anything, consider the source. And that idea of like considering the source really sort of drew me to want um, to create compelling arguments. Um, so in, at the University of Virginia, I majored in, in rhetoric, communication studies. It was all about the ethos, pathos, and logos and how to you know, formulate a compelling argument in sports science and television and everything that, 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 I, that I'm doing is really a matter of forming an argument to be persuasive. So you know, growing up, when I, when I talk about my family being incredibly influential, the church, you know, I'm all, I was born and raised Catholic, but I did not go to Catholic school. It, my parents really believed in, you know, diversity of surrounding. 
uh, of surrounding yourself with a lot of diverse people. The church, though, played a very big part and continues to play a, a big part in just keeping me in check and making sure that, you know, it's my way of, you know, meditating. It's my, I, you know, go to church every week. I pray, you know, multiple times a day. I always keep myself in check. And that's, that's because I have a personality that is A, A, A type. And if I go off the rails, I'll probably really go off the rails. So I need to make sure that I'm always, you know, keeping it between the lines, pushing the envelope without going out of bounds, um, and, you know, striving to get better. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, your production company, uh, Base Productions, was started in your parents' basement, I believe. Is that right? Yep. That is yeah. true. Good research. So could you... Could you describe those early days in the basement and how you built it into a company that you eventually sold, I think, in 2011? Yeah. I mean, my parents were incredibly supportive. And the deal was kind of, you know, if you're doing your best and you wake up and you are being productive and, um, you know, we can see that you're trying your best, we'll, we'll support you in any way we can. And we started the, the business literally out of the basement of my parents' house. You know, it wasn't particularly glamorous, but man, did it allow us to thrive. Uh, my brother-in-law was the, my business partner, and we ended up getting contracts. You know, some we, we ended up making a couple movies, and we got the contracts for the Washington Bullets slash Wizards and the Washington Capitals doing all of their production. Had that contract for a very long time, and um, we got contracts with the Discovery Channel um, because they were in the D.C. area. So we're doing sport TV and science TV out of the basement of my parents' house. And, you know, it was sort of this slow build. You know, we, we got one contract and then two contracts. Um, and then we just hurt, hit this inflection point. Um, and, you know, when, once you hit the inflection point, we, that's what sent me out to Los Angeles. We opened up an office in Los Angeles, and, but we, we still were – kind of working out of the house. You know, we were working out of the house on the East Coast and had a big office on the West Coast. Um, and so it was the early days, especially, were really, ma they're, they're really magical. And I always try to hold on to that because you don't, you, it's almost like if you knew what was coming, you'd never do it. And mm. when you have the safety and security of, knowing the people who are around you, meaning your, you know, your parents are around you, my sister was around me, my brother-in-law was around me, and um, the people who work for us were, and, and continue to work, uh, you know, continue to work with me are far more than an employee or just a, a freelancer. Like, you really foster the idea of family. Um, and I care deeply about everybody uh, who I work with. And, you know, in those early days, especially, I mean, my brother-in-law and I paid ourselves last, and we were the lowest paid people. <laughs> we were like, we got to take care of everybody else. You know, we'll, we'll get paid at some point. Um, you know, and as our business began to scale and, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to sell it, you know, we were like, all right, you know, this was, this was really worth the journey. It was great. And so now it's going off and sort of spinning that up again, and a lot of the same people are coming along for the ride because it's, oh, yeah. you know, we were last the first time. and you know, I think is going to be super exciting uh, for the second time. Well, I'm curious, um, during those early days um, in the basement, was there someone that you looked to for direction or someone that was a role model for you while you were building base productions? Maybe somebody in, a, in the industry or somebody doing something similar? So Steven Soderbergh, um, who had done Sex, Lies, and Videotape at the time, uh, he, when I was at the University of Virginia, I sought him out and because I knew I wanted to be in entertainment. And I said, listen, I want to make movies, TV shows. You're in the entertainment industry. How do I do it? And he gave me the advice, learn to do everything yourself. And that he was like, don't go to film school. Don't pay money. Figure, go find a job at a video house and just learn to do everything yourself. So when I was at the University of Virginia, I worked at the Darden Graduate School of Visual Communications. Um, and it was awesome because I took Soderbergh's advice, Soderbergh's advice and said, all right, I'm going to teach myself everything. So when you're in the basement of your parents' house, we had a space age machine at the time called an Avid, 
and it was the you know first you know large scale non linear digital editing system, and we were pretty much the only place in town that had it. We we were just very fortunate. We had a um, a very supportive investor who you know we were able to convince this would separate us and would allow us to get contracts. So we had the you know the greatest equipment. Didn't matter where it was, and it happened to be in the in the uh, Barron's house. Um, the the inspiration, you know, Soderbergh's words of "learn to do everything yourself" to this day continue continues to drive me because you learn you you learn it, you see if you're any good at it, and the things that you don't like or you're not that good at, you then hire somebody to do that, who you can you now have a benchmark of yourself in terms of how what how good something needs to be, and then you can build a real team. And you know, I still do in terms of the skill set. In those early days, I was writing, directing, producing, editing, coloring, mixing, graphicking, did everything. I was just a one-man band. Um, my partner was helping with, with really the, the business side. And all those skills, I just, you know, one by one, hired people, trained them, taught them what I knew, and would make people be- become better than I was, which was the point, right? Otherwise, I'd just do it myself. So, um, you know, the, the inspiration – uh, of learning to do things yourself and just believing and having the audacity to, to think like, Hey, I think we can make a little dent in the entertainment universe, you know, out of this, you know, basement in Vienna. Um, it, it, it was super exciting. And, uh, you know, obviously my parents are a giant influence, but beyond my parents, it was really, uh, Steven Soderbergh. Wow. It's fantastic advice from him as well. Uh, so you have produced and hosted several shows, including Fights, si- excuse me, Fight Science, Sports Science, which won six Emmys over the years and was a huge success, and now an AR series called Soul and Science. Uh, so what sets the new show apart, and what was your inspiration for it? You know, Soul and Science is just the idea of taking sports science to the next level. One of the things that you discover when you, you know, do thousands of episodes of something is that science doesn't answer everything it only it's only part of the equation Mm. and that intangible part and i refer to it as the soul is really that's really the difference between good and great it's that desire that heart that you know will the things that can't be measured because there's so many athletes and so many studies i've done where people are not the biggest, strongest, and fastest in their respective position, and they still thrive. And how do they thrive? It's because they're big enough, strong enough, fast enough. And they do more with less. And, <clears throat> and they figure out a way to be innovative. And, and um, I always respect, I always you know, found that fascinating. So soul and science is just taking that sports science idea incorporating the soul into it and looking at human performance across the spectrum. Now this show is a, is an AR show. Could you, could you talk about, a, talk about that a bit? Yeah. Augmented reality is, you know, sort of the next wave of storytelling. So I think you can go to the app store, you know, any of the app stores and download soul and science, you know, it turns your uh, coffee table into a basketball court. And, you know, we had some world's greatest athletes, um, Aaron Gordon was in dunking. He was the greatest NBA dunker of all time. Um, and we had some just incredible athletes to come into the lab. And um, it's, a, it's definitely a new frontier. So it's, it's, it's a new form of storytelling, a new medium, um, something that I think you know, has definitely a big upside in the future. It sounds really interesting. Uh, well, you mentioned earlier Kill Cliff. I want to talk to you a bit about Kill Cliff. You've recently joined the brand in an executive role. Uh, could you share the story of Kill Cliff and its founding and why you decided to join the brand? Yeah, Kill Cliff was founded by a Navy SEAL. It's run by a Navy SEAL. Um, it is, um, it, and it's a clean energy drink. It's, it, there is a problem in the world where a lot of people, especially young people, drink you know, traditional energy drinks that are high in sugar, high in, in synthetic caffeine. And the the courting process between myself and Kill Cliff went on for a while because, quite honestly, I was, you know, I'm a big drinker of water. Like, I don't drink alcohol. I don't, you know, don't drink coffee. Um, So, you know, when I came around to discover the product, 
um, and really started consuming it and saying, God, you know what, this is, you know, it's, it, there's no sugar, there's nothing fake, nothing artificial. Um, you know, it just has, you know, clean green, green tea caffeine. Um, it, it's just a drink. It's a much better version of an energy drink. And, you know, for lack of a better phrase, it's just good for you. Um, and the, the market that's out there, it, you know, very much caters toward young people and kind of preys on them, you know, banking that sugar will get them addicted and that they'll get um, hooked on caffeine. And we're really all about, look, here's a clean, healthy lifestyle, but we're also a badass, incredibly fun brand. Um, you know, if you take that, that sort of Navy SEAL spirit, you know, of being, you know, patriotic but irreverent, that uh, really sort of sums up Kilcoy. You know, it's the it's the unusual name, it's an unusual approach, uh, but it's working. You know, it's it really is working. Joe Rogan is a huge ambassador for the brand. Talks about it almost every day on his podcast. Um, and you know, we have uh, just an incredible group of influencers and you know an incredible uh, group of folks who are you know growing the brand. It will be the next giant uh, energy drink brand. It's you know well on its way. So again, you know, I was. You know, incredibly honored to join the team and to help message and sort of spread the gospel of Kilcoy. Well, you've recently joined as the chief marketing officer, and I'm curious, how do you plan to utilize your past experience um, in that new role? Yeah, it's all about messaging. You know, whether or not you're making a TV show or, you know, a movie or a commercial, you're making some kind of argument. Um, and it, it, the thing that makes arguments stick is that they're true. You know, if something is true, then it, it sticks a little bit easier, but it also has to just be entertaining. So sports <laughs> science, if, sports, if that were just an approach of being really dull and boring and, you know, very academic, never would have, you know, succeeded the way that it did. So Kill Cliff, yeah, it's a clean energy drink and yeah, it's better for you, but, you know, it's not like we're going to, you know, create uh, really boring educational spots. I think that we're, we're far too... Um, irreverent and cool and fun to uh, take yourself so seriously as to like be preaching, um, you know, medical information nonstop. You want to, you, you, people can arrive at their own decisions. They can read labels. We can tell them what the ingredients are, but, you know, most importantly, we can let them have fun. We, we, we can, we can make sure that the audience is having fun while they're participating in the product. Um, you know, I encourage everybody to go to killcliff.com. You know, and check out, uh, check out, Eric, check out the, you know, we've got an incredible CBD beverage, uh, a beverage called Ignite, and um, our Energize and Recover drink. Um, cool. I'm, I'm excited to see what you, what you do with the brand and where it goes uh, from here. Speaking of entertaining, uh, there it is. Uh, speaking of entertaining, you co-host a weekly podcast with legendary rocker Ted Nugent uh, called the De Ted Nugent Spirit Campfire. So what's it like hanging with the Nuge? Uh, and what are some of the more memorable episodes you guys have done so far? You know, it's been an amazing adventure. There, going into it, I would say I met Ted because we did a, a program called Salute Across America that was huge. We had tens of millions of um, social media followers that we were streaming out to um, in a salute to our troops on Memorial Day, especially those who have you know made the ultimate sacrifice. And Ted you know, I met through, you know, a, a common, you know, through a mutual friend, and he was like, hey, I want to play the national anthem. So, it, you know, in getting to know uh, Ted, it's interesting that there is real, there's perception and reality. And when you say Ted Nugent uh, to sort of the masses, everyone will say, oh my God, you know, he's, you know, this crazy, you know, right-wing fanatic and you know, I don't know if I, I don't know, you know, how close I want to be to Ted. And I will, I will tell you what, he has, he has impressed me with how open, accepting, how passionate he is. When people are like, look, you know, he's a, you know, he's a right wing hunter. And, you know, that, like he believes in the hunting lifestyle and he's really pro Second Amendment and blah, 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 blah. He's got his views and his opinions, but he respects others and he, he likes other people too. Uh, express their opinion. So the reason why he and I work so well together is, first of all, he's incredibly authentic. And I, I like to think that, you know, I'm very WYSIWYG and what you see is what you get. Um, and, you know, the, he is, first of all, his fan base is incredible. And second of all, the messaging of, 
you know, love everyone. Like, let's love everyone. Let's kill them with kindness. Let's, you know, be really open. You know, the guy, I, I don't drink alcohol. He doesn't drink alcohol. I've never smoked pot. He's never smoked pot. He's, you know, just, I mean, he's 72. And I mean, honestly, he's got the energy of a 17 year old. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's pretty, it, it's pretty incredible. I, I highly encourage people to check it out because, you know, the perception and reality are two totally different things. And you know, I agree. I, I agree. I've heard, I've heard him interviewed in a few different formats and it is surprising. Like you get a deeper insight into the guy when you hear him in more of a long form format and he's not this crazy right wing nut that most people make him out to be. You guys started the podcast this year, I believe. So I'm curious, yeah. what are some of the more memorable episodes that you guys have done so far? God, you know, we, in general, the podcast stays away from politics just because it's the, the spirit campfire is all about being positive. I mean, everybody's sitting around at a campfire swapping stories. So, you know, we had Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top on and, you know, Ted and, and, and uh, Billy with ZZ Top uh, have played together a ton. Um, that episode was a, a total blast. We had Mike Huckabee on. Um, you know, and everyone's like, oh, my God, it's going to be mired in politics. But I don't even think we, we mentioned the word politics in, or party. And, you know, Mike Huckabee was a, it, it was a great uh, musician in his own right. Yeah. And we're swapping stories about, you know, playing in bands. And he's a big hunter. He loved to go out hunting. And, you know, that hunting lifestyle is just, inc is just incredible. You know, we had, um, we had Sarah Palin on. And, again, you know, you say Sarah Palin and everyone has their sort of preconceived notions. She's amazing. And she, she has the best sense of humor. Um, you know, she's accomplished so much in her life and she's just super, super positive. So it, it, you know, we've had some incredible episodes and I just love the episodes where it's just, you know, the two of us, where it's just Ted and myself rapping. We really, we really have um, a, a great fan base, you know, it was the highest rated show on Facebook. Um, wow. for a couple of weeks and it's you know it just performs really well the engagement is through the roof so it's you, um, and you guys are both having a great time as well that's, yeah that sounds awesome um, I want to move on to the Ray of Hope Foundation um, what was the inspiration for the foundation and what are some of the standout stories from the foundation that you might like to share yeah we, you know we started it because Ray Lewis who I met through sports science he and I just became fast friends and Honestly, I can say he's just one of my best friends. We've just stayed in touch and, you know, we've done so many things together. So I had, um, there was a, a relative who I had who um, had brain cancer and was a massive um, Ravens fan. So I just called up Ray and, you know, like celebrities get calls all the time to say, hey, let's send out a, a message of hope. So he, he Ray, Ray's the kind of friend and guy that he'll put down everything right there and then and just do what needs to be done he's a man of god mm. he's an incredibly positive figure um and he you know d recorded this inspirational video uh, on that same day another friend of mine called and you know there was a kid who who um suffered a near fatal um accident on a football field and for whatever you know i was and you know sports science was something that he really you know loved and his parents asked if i would send a message of inspiration i was like yeah that's great so Ray sent off his message and I sent off my message. And, you know, the, at the time, you know, Ray's message, you know, helped uh, my relative so much, you know, the brain cancer went away miraculously and it was just incredible. And uh, the, the young, young man who had the accident on the football field, he was told he was never going to walk again. And, you know, he ended up walking and is just an incredible inspiration. Um, so we just formed the Ray of Hope Foundation where we just have a, a really rich roster of, um, of you know, celebrities and athletes. Well, let, don't, don't be so humble. Let's, let's, why don't you rattle off a few names of people who've uh, done it so far? I mean, look, it's, it's really, even the people who are listed on the site are just a, just a couple of the people. If you, if you sort of just go down the list and, and um, start thinking, the reason why Ray and I were like, this is a good idea, is because we're really one degree away from anybody on the planet. Yeah. Uh, so, if, you know, someone's like, hey, I like athlete X. It's, it's you know, I, I know a lot of athletes, as does Ray. And so if I don't know that athlete directly, I certainly know someone connected to them. Um, and so you can get to anyone and then it just expands out. So 
you know, it's definitely, it, there's definitely some amazing names. Um, I don't want to get caught up in, in, in sort of the names and name dropping, but the, uh, the idea, uh, the idea behind sports science was that I would invite athletes in the lab to push themselves to the limit. Didn't never pay to anybody because I'm like, look, if you're the best at what you do, you're not going to ask for money because money is just a byproduct and you get paid in other ways. And this is a gift that you're giving back to the world and you're also learning something. So it was an incredible exchange for Ray of Hope. It's look, you know, you're in a fortunate position where someone out there, you know, really thinks highly of you. So, you know, to return that energy in the form of inspiration is something that it's a gift to be able to do that, to have anybody, you know, look at you and say, Hey, you're an inspiration to me, or you're someone I look up to. You have a responsibility, I think, to return that energy in the terms of, in the form of positive energy. It's a, it's a great concept and I, I love what you guys are doing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so John, who is a person today that you look to as an inspiration in your life? Um, someone you know, or even a public figure that maybe you have not met? Yeah, I mean, uh, my inspiration, and this is not a cop-out answer, I'm, I'm so family-centric. You know, I have a wife and two kids, and, you know, my wife has always, you know, we've now been married 17 years. Uh, she's just, when I say she's an inspiration, I mean, the reason why she's an inspiration, um, we met on a plane, sat next to each other, fell instantly in love. Turns out we live two blocks away from each other on the same wow. in LA. So it, God sometimes throws you a softball and says, here you go, here's your wife. Um, <laughs> you know, and she's got, and like, and you know, the day that we met is kind of, that's the day that we celebrate because we don't really have an engagement date in our marriage. Um, we, we ended up getting married in the Vatican, was able to piece together some incredible relationships. Um, but we, you know, my wife is, she is the most positive person I know. And she, she's always, always positive. And it, it's hard. It, it was, it, even in the early days, it was hard to understand how are you so positive all the time? And if something didn't go right, if something didn't fall her way, or so, it was literally shifting the attitude of rather than dang it, that didn't work out. It was, oh, well, not supposed to be doing that or getting that or receiving that or wanting that, and I should be looking elsewhere. And it like never really phased her. And that, that idea of being incredibly positive is super powerful. Um, so she inspires me every day. And she's, you know, an incredible athlete, an incredible mom, and an incredible wife, and, you know, is definitely the smarter, better-looking, more talented you know, one of the two of us, for sure. Well, you're a lucky man. John, you're an inspirational person, but uh, as discussed, you are also in some of, the, some of the projects that you do, focused on lifting up and inspiring others. So I'm gonna give you the final word here and ask you to share some inspiring thoughts or advice for those listening and watching, to the, watching this, uh, especially in the strange times we're living in. So John, please. You know, the, the times we're living in are beyond beyond the strange and they actually reside in what I, what I refer to as the unimaginable. I mean, a year ago, if you were to say, you know, schools are shut down, everyone's wearing a mask, you know, no one's traveling. It's like there are pockets of the country with in incredible, you know, unrest. You would just say that's, that's Looneyville, but that's where we're living. I think the idea and the way to get out of this and the way there are a couple ways that if each individual did this, then I think you rise above. Number one is bring value. Like, are you an asset or a liability to life? I mean, are you doing anything good? Are you spreading positive energy? Are you, in terms of your career, are you actually bringing value or are you just taking up space? In terms of your family, are you being a good dad or a good mom? Are you being a good friend? You know right from wrong. So be valuable. That, that It's a very simple concept, but it's one that every time that you do something that you know is not right, you devalue your own currency in the world. And that's up to you. That's not a, that's not, it, it, that's not unattainable. That is attainable by everyone. And then I think that the most important thing is 
recognize that humans are good. You, you are a good person. Does evil exist? Of course evil exists. But evil only exists because it, it is perpetuated just like good. So bad energy and negative energy perpetuates ne negative energy and positive energy perpetuates positive energy. But we are born good. And when you think about that, and this is a deep philosophical argument, people say, well, how do you know humans are good? I mean, just ask yourself, if you're walking behind, you know, it, you know a little old lady and she drops something, do you pick it up or not? And I'd be willing to say 99.999% of all humans from anywhere, one-on-one, -on -one, when they see someone in need, they help. And for whatever reason, one-on-one, -on -one, we're excellent. Two-on-two, three-on-three, 2,000-on-2,000, two the bigger the numbers get, the worse we behave as humans. And if we keep bringing it back to that idea that, wait a minute, I am good, and if the group that I find myself in is not doing what I would do when I'm alone, then maybe I'm in the wrong group. And that takes courage to stand up, especially in these crazy times, and say, you know what? I'm not down with that. Whatever these people are doing, I'm not in. That's not how I would behave. So you have to have courage to, and conviction to first start with yourself, recognize your, your good, and move on with the people you surround yourself with, it's important to say, you know what? My, the peop these are my peeps. These people represent me as well. It's the expression of, you know, you're judged by the five people you spend the most time with. Choose those people wisely. Well said, John, well said. So John, I wanna thank you for sharing your story with us today. This has been a great talk. You're an inspiring person and it's been great to hear about your journey and your inspirations as well. I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today on Meet My Inspiration. Uh, no problem, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks a lot. God bless everybody, see ya. My thanks to John for his time and for sharing his story with us. Be sure to check out his latest series, Soul and Science, available via the app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. Also, don't miss the podcast, Ted Nugent, Spirit Campfire, wherever podcasts are available. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Meet My Inspiration, and I hope we've been able to inspire you too, even if just a little. Sometimes that's all it takes to make great things happen. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like broadcasting to the world everything you do online. Here's how to protect yourself and get three months for free. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. ExpressVPN works on all devices, phones, laptops, even routers, so that everyone who shares your Wi-Fi is protected too. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is super easy. Just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by TechRadar, Wired, The Verge, and countless others. So if you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash MMI, and you can get an extra three months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash MMI.